The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing those things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, are we afraid of the crowd? For all that regard John is a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And they said to him, and he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man has two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go to work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not, but later changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said to the, said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two would, did the will of his father? And they said the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so in that gospel reading we just heard, the, the religious leaders, baffled by Jesus, sort of sputter at him, but by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? So there's got to be some backstory here, right? I mean, clearly there is a conflict about where real authority comes from, and by extension, what what real leadership looks like. So to make sense of the conflict, we, we have to know what Jesus has done to upset the religious leaders. Well, with today's reading, we have skipped ahead in Matthew's gospel from where we were last week, sort of leapfrogging over Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And we find ourselves now, this morning, in the, in the midst of the rising conflict leading up to Good Friday. So here's what Jesus has done to push the religious leader's buttons. He, he's ridden in triumph into Jerusalem, the political capital and the center of the Jewish universe. And then he's driven the merchants out of the temple, literally turning the tables on the existing religious order. So in two quick strokes on the same day, Jesus has taken on the Roman Empire and the Jewish leadership. <laughs> Both church and state need to be turned upside down, <laughs> Jesus says. So no wonder the leaders are asking him, by what authority are you doing these things? And then as if this fire needed stoking, Jesus responds by telling a series of parables against the religious leaders letting them know that their days in the sun are numbered because of their arrogance and self-righteousness. <laughs> it is a story we know too, right? I mean, just this past week, the news has given us pictures of a, of a powerful senator who's become a cartoon character, as far as I'm concerned, with bars of gold and wads of cash sticking out of his pockets. I mean... But like all characters in a political cartoon, Senator Menendez, in this case, is, is a symbol of so much more that's wrong in our world of political leadership. I mean, yesterday our legislators did actually meet the deadline to attend to their basic responsibility to keep the government's doors open, at least for 45 more days, at which point we'll get to go through this dance all over again watching them substituting their agendas for the nation's interest. But there's plenty of, you know, critique to go around, right? Because sadly, arrogance doesn't stop at the capital steps. There's been plenty of it in beautiful spaces like this, too. You know, if you've been around the church a while, you, you know that for years, the church could count on social pressure to 
drive people to come to worship on Sundays. The, the question really was, you know, who has the more attractive preacher or music program or kids ministry or whatever. But now the social pressure to go to church is gone. And as we have heard over and over, folks are voting with their feet, leaving, to, leaving church to find meaning someplace else. If you need evidence of this, for example, in, in 2006, the proportion of Americans identifying as religiously unaffiliated was 16%. Now it is 27% and growing. And the Episcopal Church faces the same problems with even more intensity. Our, our general church's membership has dropped 21% in the last decade. Why is that? There are probably a hundred reasons why that is, but at least for me, I think much of the issue comes down to whose needs have we been prioritizing. I, I think often church leaders, lay and ordained, have become conditioned to think in terms of the well-being of the institution first. I mean, we hear it all the time, maybe without really even recognizing it. The church needs to grow. The church needs young families, you know, that kind of thing. That's not wrong. It's just not the point. <laughs> I mean, Mother Jean and I have been blessed in the last little while to have some great conversations with a member here who was a marketing professional. And, and he's been helping us see the difference and listen for the difference between focusing on the institution versus focusing on the people the institution is there to serve and then communicating that way. It, it's part of a shift we've been trying to make for years here, a shift toward reclaiming mission over maintenance in the church. In, in other words, trying to discern what the people in the pews and the people around us actually need rather than, you know, cooking up the next attractive offering to keep the church chugging along. Paradoxically, but maybe not surprisingly, given our faith, the church will find success by focusing less on our desire to succeed and focusing more on our call to give ourselves away, you know, loving and serving the people that God brings here and the people God places alongside us. I pray that that kind of reflection will also be happening in our diocese in the months ahead. So you, you may have noticed a new recurring intercession in the prayers of the people each Sunday, and, and, and you'll hear it about a hundred more times between now and, well, over the next 18 months, because we're searching for a new bishop in, in our diocese. Now, over the past year, our, <clears throat> our diocesan leadership bodies have spent some time studying the missional history of the Episcopal Church in West Missouri, including how previous bishops would spend day after day on the road visiting tiny mission stations and preaching in larger congregations and confirming new members and speaking to civic groups and uniting people in twice as many West Missouri communities as currently have an Episcopal presence. And based on that return to our roots, we've redone the diocesan budget from scratch for next year, trying to prioritize equipping smaller congregations to serve the people around them rather than just gasping for breath. And meanwhile, the Diocesan Standing Committee has been designing the process for our bishop search, because we have to do that. And, and in a couple of weeks, we will announce the members of the bishop search committee. Now, those are the folks who will create the profile of our diocese, you know, telling the story to potential applicants of who we've been and who we are and who we hear God asking us to become. So this committee will also screen the people who apply to be bishop and raise up those whom God might be calling to lead us in this transition time for the Episcopal Church. And then next August, this coming August, 
Um, the search committee will present three to five candidates for election and our diocesan convention delegates will choose one of them as bishop a, a year from this November. So what kind of a leader will we be looking for? Well, today's gospel reading gives us one portrait of religious leadership. People who assume that their credentials privilege their point of view. People who hear a challenge and rush to silence it. People who focus on protecting their power and end up saying and doing little of any real value for the people they're supposed to be serving. And we can definitely see that model of leadership among the cartoon characters in Washington, but you know, we've, we've also seen it in the church. Leaders who are interested in their own position and, or, or maybe anxious about the appearance of their congregation's success, rather than guiding and forming people to follow Jesus and serve the folks that God had placed around them. So, so as we pray for the bishop search over and over again for the next year and a half, just who are we asking God for? Well, before I answer that, I, I want to share something personal. <laughs> you know, in, in search processes like this, the typical posture is for potential candidates to sort of dance a little sidestep, keeping, keeping their options open through artful non-commitment. <laughs> And by the same token, the, the typical approach for folks in the pews, I think, especially here in the land of Midwest nice, um, is, is not to ask directly so they don't put their leader on the spot about their plans, you know. I don't think any of that does us much good. In fact, I think it leads us into the kingdom of anxiety, you know, into the, the thickets of what's Father John going to do? So let me tell you what Father John's going to do. I am not going to be a candidate for bishop. And now, no, no. What, what matters is why. God's not calling me to it. I mean, if God were calling me to it, this would be a really different conversation. Um, but, but I believe I've gotten enough clarity to know that that call isn't there. And there are several reasons why. Part of it is about this historical moment. Um, I, I kind of doubt that a, a middle-aged, straight, white guy from this diocese is the one we're going to be seeking once the profile is complete, honestly. It, it's also about the ministry of a bishop. I mean, I'm not enraptured with the work of the larger Episcopal Church, and, and a bishop ends up spending a lot of time and energy on that. It's also about the schedule of a bishop. I mean, as we've learned looking back at the inspiring work of bishops from a century ago and from the inspiring work of our current bishop provisional, Bishop Diane, you know, looking at those examples, you see that a good bishop must be on the move, <laughs> showing up all over the diocese and doing that long, slow, slogging, one-on-one -on -one work of leading the sheep. I mean, if I were bishop, that's how I'd need to do it. But, but here's the primary reason this isn't a good fit. That kind of schedule won't work for Ann and me. And you know this. She struggles with a lot of health issues secondary to her lupus. I mean, honestly, we never know what's coming one week to the next. And, and even as it is now, I struggle to be present at home enough so I don't think I'm called to a job that would put me always on the road. Anyway, back to the more important question. Who are we asking God for when we offer that prayer for the bishop search? I mean, specifically, I don't know, of course. We have, we have a lot more work to do as we discern the mind of Christ on that question. But I can tell you this much that looking to the mind of Christ is exactly the right approach to this discernment. So let me leave you today with what I think is maybe the very best answer to the question, who should be our next bishop? 
because this much I know with all my heart that our next bishop must be the person who best fits the uh, executive leadership profile that we heard today in the reading from Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.